Kia ora kato no mai hari mai. Greetings and welcome to this EHF live session. Edmund Hillary Fellowship, it's a collective of entrepreneurs, scientists, storytellers, creatives and investor change makers who want to make an impact globally from Aotearoa New Zealand. And under this session today, you are going to hear from Kate and Harmon and Matthew is going to curate the whole session. It's a 90 minute session. But firstly, these are informal sessions and they're planned in a way that when you leave here after the 90 minutes, you feel you know the fellows and our guest speakers on a personal level and you can understand what they're trying to do here in New Zealand and that then you can connect with them directly afterwards. The recording will be on our website for you to um, download and watch and to send on to other people. So stay muted while the conversation's going and then Matthew can curate some Q&A and you can also put comments and questions in the chat as we're going along. Over to you, Matthew. Uh, kia ora, Michelle. Thank you so much for hosting this space. Uh, I'm just going to open us with a quick karakia. Kia hora te marino, kia whakapapa paunama e moana, ki hararara ma tautou e te ranginai, aroha atu aroha mai, tātou e ai, tātou katoa, hi u taike. Um, basically, that's just saying, may peace be widespread, may the sea be like a green stone, a pathway for us all this day. Let us show and respect for each other, for one another, bind us all together. And i uh, like to open up with that karakia, really simply because of the fact that, you know, I think climate and uh, biodiversity is something that we're all dealing with as individuals. And in particular, it's it's hard sometimes to understand the work and Hamana Hamana and I are doing, but it really is about water security at, at the end of the day because it is such the lifeblood of the way that we um, that we live. You know, we talk about the divine principle of, of the amount of water that's made up in the world is almost identical to the amount of water that's made up in the body. And so, you know, today I will give you a quick overview of what we're going to cover, um, and then I'll um, and then we'll jump. We'll kind of jump straight into it. So can everybody see my screen? Uh, if, if you're muted, then I um, I can't hear anything. Yes, we can see it. <laughs> Great. Okay, so um, we'll start with some introductions. Uh, we, we're really privileged to have a forward by um, Owen Gaffney, who is also part of the fellowship. I'll take some time to set the context. And from there, uh, Kate's gonna cover off uh, really what our commitment is to uh, Te Reti o Waitangi. We're gonna cover off the, the planetary uh, accounting network and the work that Kate's doing and recontextualizing. Um, the, for us, I guess from, from Harman and I's perspective and why we're so interested in planetary accounting is that we have looked at climate from the perspective of waste and carbon, but really it's so much more important than that when you look at the planetary accounting boundaries. And Kate has created a framework that actually allows us to bring that down to a project level. And from there, what we're gonna do is apply some of that work of her work to a practical example, looking at both what is the status quo and what does a circular system look like? Um, and at that point in time, Haman's gonna take uh, take us through what does it look like to build, I guess, an integrated waste treatment system that's fully circular at a regional level. And looking at examples around agriculture and around how um, by collaborating and opening up our discussions across an industry, across industry verticals and across councils, uh, we can actually look at climate change holistically in a region. From there, we're going to go into a question time and we'll, we'll do an experiment. Hopefully, people are kind of familiar with Miro now that we've been in the pandemic and, and we'll, we'll get to do some, some interaction um, and then cover off kind of how we want to work with us um, before just uh, closing karakia. So that, that will be the overview for today. And into introductions. Um, uh, Dr. Kate Meyer, we, we first came across Kate's work when we were looking at the incredible work that she'd done at Becker as head of sustainability there. And Haman and I were fortunate to meet Kate inside of the Creative Accelerator Climate Exchange um, Acceleration Program that's, that's just ended. And from there, we realized 
like how much her work was relevant to what we were doing. And then uh, my co-founder, Haman, uh, we met, at the, I guess, at, at the beginning of his EH journey, his EHF journey. And, you know, he's now based in Christchurch, New Zealand, has moved here with his family and two daughters. Um, just absolute privilege to be able to work with, with him uh, and, and on, this, on this journey. And myself, uh, Matthew Jackson, Toko Ingoa, no koe aho e waihara kiki e te waipunama o Aotearoa, ko waikara te awa e maha nei aku a maraharara, ko tangaringo te maunga e te rai e naku, ta, taku nakau e mihi ana ki nga toto uh, ne te, ki nga toho nehe tamiki makare e wai a naho anu. Um, I was born in Blenheim, which is where we're going to be building a demonstration plant, just a little bit to the side of that in Nelson. Uh, my heart cries because of the, the challenges we're seeing with Waikato River at the moment. Uh, and much like Kate loves her time on a mountain, Tongariro is where I live to snowboard and love my time. But now I respect the, 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 the place I live in, which is Tamaki Makato in Auckland. So with that, I'm just going to... Um, hand, uh, share my screen again and let us open the space with a foreword from Owen Gaffney. Uh, Owen is, uh, he has been involved in, in creating the Planetary Boundary Guidelines, works at the Stockholm Resilience Centre. She, uh, he's also, um, oh my gosh, I can't even, I can't even recall the number of things that he's involved with when it comes to communications around climate change. Um, but we're, he's, uh, he's, on the Institute for Climate Impact Research and the Global Commons Alliance. So a bit of a mouthful, but it's incredible the work that he's doing. And um, we're just really privileged to have him be involved in, in providing a forward. So I'll share my screen and let's see if we can get that up. Action. Hey, hi there, Kate. Hi there, Matthew. Hi, everyone at EHF. Uh, wonderful to be here. Um, so it's been 13 years, 13 years since the publication of the Planetary Boundaries Framework back in, in 2009, uh, which was a landmark achievement. Uh, for the first time, we had an Earth System Framework uh, for a stable operating system for humanity, for civilization, uh, a stable operating system for humanity, and that we know that uh, for the previous 10,000 years, that's been the only state we know that civilization can thrive. Um, and what's interesting about the boundaries framework is that um, it wasn't a single boundary identified, it wasn't 1,000 boundaries um, identified, it was, it was nine boundaries um, identified as, as the key priorities for humanity. Um, but then, uh, as, as it was published, we also announced that we'd crossed three of those boundaries related to climate change, biodiversity and biogeochemical cycles, our use of phosphorus and, and nitrogen in agriculture mainly. Um, since 2009, uh, the boundaries has been updated in a full boundaries assessment updated in 2015. And there we showed that, in fact, a fourth boundary had been crossed relating to, to land use, particularly deforestation. And now here in 2022, uh, two new papers have emerged announcing that we've crossed two more boundaries, one for novel entities, uh, you know, chemical pollution, plastics, and the second for, uh, for water use, for soil moisture, um, as the, the water cycle is changing as a result of human activity. Um, so there we have it. So we have nine planetary boundaries. We've now transgressed six of those boundaries. We're in the danger area. This is now a priority for humanity to, to come back within a safe operating sp space, which is why it is so important that we work to downscale the boundaries at national levels, at regional levels, and at the level for, for companies and businesses um, to, to operate within boundaries. Uh, this is why uh, the work being done with the, the um, um, on, on any downscaling um, is, is absolutely critically important. It's some of the most important work uh, being done on Earth today. Thank you. Well, uh, I don't know about you, but when I when Owen sent that through to me this morning, I was just a little bit a little bit shocked, right? Um, and kind of in terms of the you know the context setting for today's session, um, you know the 
not you know Owen was referring to the fact that now novel entities and bio biogeological flows of kind of crossing these boundaries then that land system change is just kind of becoming out of control and when you look at what's happening in our media you know what we're asking the question of is we'll look ultimately who is going to be who is going to be paying the cost for that change and how do we how do we actually create new systems um, both pr to procure different outcomes but also from a new economic framework not have a direct impact on all of our economy in a way that will bankrupt our ratepayers right now the reality is is it's affecting everybody and you know we're we're Haman and uh, our other our team member Marcus is based you know we're seeing you know major political issues when it comes to kind of the use of infrastructure and and really what we're trying to say is that you know from a circular perspective if we cross over boundaries and start to look from a procurement lens on uh, on all of the planetary boundary guidelines we'll start to look at different solutions um, and in the case of of Canterbury, we can see that they're dealing with issues around odor, they're dealing with issues around the capital cost of new infrastructure, the emissions liability, and, and across the country, we, we need to transition to more clean and green energy, right? But at the same time, we're facing major problems in our primary sector, right? We, we're seeing this agricultural greenhouse gas footprint is now becoming something that's really relevant for uh, and is actually going to start costing farmers over the next three or four years. We have a major mental health issue with our farmers who have been criticised and scapegoated, but actually are, are some of the most land-loving people that I've ever met. Um, but we are seeing nitrates in our water harming public health and seeing expecting new water regulation and, and the consolidation of water infrastructure to, to make a huge difference on the way that we're managing infrastructure in New Zealand. Because actually we've seen major issues when it comes from when it comes to the discharge and the management of our wastewater systems in New Zealand as well. And and, and really seeing in significant blowouts in, in regional um, budgets when it comes to renewal of infrastructure of building and building infrastructure. But when it comes to building that infrastructure, we're still building it based on what we would consider last generation or industrial control system, uh, industrial generation systems and so really you know it, we are facing a, a crisis that we're going to need to think differently about the way that we uh the, about the way that we build new systems and and what that will what what consequence that will have so today uh we're going to talk a little bit to kate about how she sees or what her worldview is when it comes to actually looking at systems not looking at them just from a a, a climate lens and a carbon perspective, but actually what it's a more holistic way of looking at how do we solve climate when it takes into consideration biodiversity. And um, I think that's more than enough for me, actually the stars of the show here today are Kate and Haman, and I'd love to hand over to Kate to start to take us through a little bit about the Planetary Accounting Network. Thanks, Matthew. Just trying to find my unmute button and um and share my screen. Um, uh, kia ora tato, it's really nice to um, have uh, been invited by Matthew to come along and um, take part in this karero today. Uh, I, I guess um, just reflecting on that video, it's it's nothing new, you know, that I, I operate in this planetary accounting space uh, full time, planetary boundary space full time. But I have to say um, that just hearing that update um, from Owen, um, uh, it was a little bit emotional, actually, I think uh, every time I kind of go back and up, update slides that are more than a year or so old, um, the dial has shifted so fast um, that it's it's quite alarming. And actually, I was chatting to my eight year old about it a couple of weeks ago, and he said, you know, mum, I don't, I don't want to be a planetary accountant when I become, when I grow up because it's just really depressing. And I think, you know, while I, um, uh, I try to, you know, I think we all need to just maintain a, a really forward looking attitude. Um, it, it does sometimes actually get to me like that. And that was one of those moments, um, but really cool um, that, that, you, um, that he sent that through for us. Um, I just want to, I guess, start um, today by sharing this uh, Whakatauki um, Te Porahita o Te 
Putaya, um, which means the life circle of the environment. Um, and so it goes, Kia to te rangi marie, o te rangi e tuiho nei, o papato nuku e takato nei, o te taia o e afi nei, ki ranga i a tato, tihe wa moriora. And what it um, uh, sort of the, the meaning translates to say that it's really only when the spiritual world and the heavens um, and the physical world are brought together by the active participation of the kaitiaki, of the guardians, can there be true um, peace and, and well-being. And I guess um, that's really the, the basis for all the, the work that I do. The... Um, uh, you know, I think I was talking to an incredible lady last week from um, Ngāti Toa when, when I was up in Wellington for the, uh, the Accelerator program. And she was talking about her ancestors who were so in touch with the environment that they could accurately predict the weather about three years out. Uh, three, not three years, <laughs> that would be amazing, but uh, three weeks, uh, which is still pretty incredible. Uh, I, I'm actually, I live in Wanaka and as Matthew alluded to, I'm a pretty keen skier and I don't even trust the weather forecast a day out, you know, that we're doing with these, you know, quite um, advanced computer models. Um, and, you know, I think the the problem with this is Whakato, this is that it's really true that we can only sort of succeed if we can all participate in that um, katiaki and that guardianship. Um, but actually, that's very difficult to do these days. Life has become so removed from the environment. You know, our clothes arrive in buildings on hangers. Um, you know, we go into air-conditioned um uh, sheds or supermarkets to get our food um, and so although I think there's this huge drive you know um, from from consumers and businesses to shift the dial and move into that sustainability space it's actually really difficult uh, to do that. Um, I think there are, there are two two major problems I think the first is that many people are still very focused on climate and actually don't even understand that full perspective of the planetary boundaries but then even for those that do understand it, actually, they don't have the tools to do anything about it. I, um, as, as Matthew mentioned, I was the um, sustainability, at direct, uh, sustainability director at Becker until recently. And so I spent a lot of time um, speaking with business leaders over the past few years about their sustainability aspirations and challenges. And, you know, the message is really consistent is that they're really struggling um, to make the right decisions um, and also they're terrified of kind of coming out and talking about sustainability because there's this huge movement in businesses being accused of um, greenwashing by making sort of unsubstantiated claims. I've also spent a lot of time talking to central and local government, um, mostly in New Zealand over the past couple of years, um, but it's it's really similar. They're also struggling. Um, and for, from that perspective, it's it's really how to um, prioritise and take a really systemic view of the problem. There's, um, I think, becoming more and more clarity that that's what's needed, uh, but it's really difficult to do. And actually, um, I was just chatting to um, some of the sustainability leads at, at Dunedin um, last week, and they said, you know, it's so hard because we want to do this, but then we're like, well, what if there are un unintended consequences and how can we really understand what the outcomes of, of the different decisions we make are going to be and then you know speaking to consumers and I've actually um, run some really interesting focus groups um, with uh, consumers late, uh, quite recently and for them it's you know this they're motivated to, to make better choices but actually it's really hard to do that um, and uh, they're really concerned that you know they don't feel enabled to make to take action, but they're not seeing businesses or governments move at the pace that's needed. And so there's, um, you know, this, this sort of three three different sort of player groups, if you like, all, all facing these really big challenges. And I think um, from my perspective, um, you know, I've, I've been working in the sustainability space for about 15 years. And really, as soon as I started working in that space, I was like, man, the you know, what I've, what I've learned about sustainability through the science and what we're seeing people do in reality is just uh, not, not really related at all. And I was, you know, really, really quite concerned about that. And I actually started tinkering around in my spare time trying to create a little tool uh, that um, would help help to address this. But actually, you know, the, the problem is 
it's, it's huge. <laughs> it's a huge gap and a, a really complex problem. Um, and so in 2013, I left my job as a sustainable building designer and started to say, well, what could we actually do about this um, in, in real terms? And almost immediately um, landed on the planetary boundaries framework. And, you know, it was that, oh, somebody's actually, you know, put the numbers around this, you know, my background is engineering, um, and I love, I love numbers. And I think at that stage felt like if we could just um, quantify sustainability, we'd, we'd all be okay. And, you know, and then, you know, I guess it just emphasizes that disconnect that the planetary boundaries was published in 2009 and it wasn't until I actually went um, from the business world into the academic world that I um, heard of heard of them um, because I you know it was it was such a an exciting thing for me to say okay well we've quantified it so so now what do we do and I think the planetary boundaries um, uh, work is perhaps the most important um, sort of publication um, that, that there is because it really sets out the challenge very clearly. We need to respect these nine priority areas um, if we have if we want to avoid you know fundamentally changing the planet. The problem is that this is a, an incredibly important health check, but it actually doesn't really help to um, unpick what to do about it. And so, you know, and, and Owen talking about, you know, this, this downscaling, um, there's a, you know, there's a need to take these from that global scale and say, okay, well, what do we do about it? And I think the best way to sort of understand that challenge is to imagine you were going to visit the doctor. And the doctor would, um, you know, measure your heart rate and your blood pressure and weigh you. And then, you know, imagine if she turned to you and, and shook her head and said, oh, you know, it's very bad news. You're, you know, you're obese. Your blood pressure's through the roof. You have tachycardia. And then said, okay, thank you. Have a nice day and sent, and sent you out the room. And I, I think, you know, the, the planetary boundaries is that health check. It says, you know, we have a really big problem and this is where the problem is and here are our focus areas. And so what I set out to do once I discovered it is to say, well, okay, so what is the prescription? What, is the, what are the tangible actions that we need to do so that we can translate that to the scales that we actually make decisions? Because I'd, I'd say nobody in the world is making decisions at, at that global scale. And so I came up with a framework that I called planetary accounting that helps people to determine what they can do to play their role in returning us to within the planetary boundaries. Um, and so it works at, at every, every different scale, addressing that business level, those government levels and, and those um, individual levels. And so I was working on this and then I thought, man, this is this is pretty neat. I think this could be amazing, but <laughs> who am I to try and translate this incredible global framework that was developed by all these incredible scientists? Um, and so I actually um, started calling them up and said, I'd like to come and visit you and um, get your input on this on this framework. And um, there was such a positive response from the global scientific community. It was actually blew my mind um, how warm and welcoming um, everybody was and so um, my husband uh, quit his job and we packed our children into a caravan and we spent um, a whole year traveling around Europe to go and visit all of these incredible um, scientists and so I uh, got to spend um, a couple of weeks with um, Will Stefan and, and Johan Rockström um, sat in um, Johan Rockström's um, office um, for a few days working and so I got to um, be a fly on the wall for some meetings and um, man he um, he's a pretty incredible uh, person uh, but also took the framework around social scientists um, uh, Catherine Richardson at DTU um, who's also one of the lead authors of Planetary Boundaries the Water Footprint Network, Nitrogen Footprint Group, um, to really get, um, make sure that it was really scientifically rigorous what we were doing, but also that it was really connected into the science, social sciences around behavior change and how you can actually, um, you know, take science and put it into action with businesses and governments and people. So the way that it works is it basically translates the outcomes of the planetary boundaries into global budgets. Now it looks really nice and simple with the, a little pink arrow as if um, that was a, a kind of a linear translation. And behind there is, is a pretty complex um, diagram of, of chaos. Uh, but, um, but what it means is that there are um, these global budgets and environmental currencies that we can use a little bit like carbon accounting with science um, science-based carbon accounting. So like carbon accounting, we can say, look, we want to avoid 
global warming of 1.5 degrees. Um, and so here's a global budget and then we can start sharing it up and we can look at the carbon footprint of a product or a project or a company or a person um, and compare that with those global limits. Um, planetary accounting lets you take that approach across all of the, the planetary boundaries. And so I guess um, for those of you who don't um, sort of sit in the um, environmental accounting space, there's, there's two reasons that what this that planetary accounting really is, is a bit game changing. Um, what you can do at the moment is you can either do something like a life cycle assessment, or you might have heard of environmental product disclosures, where you get a whole host of complex environmental data and lots of complicated metrics. Um, but there's no context. And actually, to be honest, you really, frankly, need a PhD in, in environmental accounting to even understand it at you know, face value. Even with that, there's no context to say, are these numbers good or bad? You can only compare them to, uh, is it better than another product? Um, or um, you can take, um, you can get quite good context around carbon, but then you get a really narrow lens for decision making. And so planetary accounting simplifies that broader environmental data and puts the context around it so that it can be as straightforward as carbon accounting, but with that holistic planetary lens. I'm not going to speak to this slide in a lot of detail, I'm just going to whiz through it, but basically just to give you an idea of um, the variety of things that you could do with it, um, you know, you could take the Paris Agreement negotiations and um, expand them to biodiversity and all, all of these other indicators. Um, there's actually a report called the Safe Operating Space for Aotearoa that translates the planetary boundaries to, um, to New Zealand and, you know, it sends, sends a message that well, we're well, well beyond them, which is no surprise, but, you know, planetary accounting would help to inform roadmaps for national action plans or, you know, future scenarios and roadmaps at city or regional level. Um, we're doing some neat work around some complex systems like global food models, you know, how would you meet nutritional needs within the planet's limits? You could put financial value against each of those currencies. Um, it, uh, you can do, um, you can use it for sustainable product design, um, for corporate science-based targets that go beyond carbon, um, really to look at the impacts of local action. Um, and we're doing a really neat program called Planetary Facts that I'll tell you a little bit more um, about um, later on. But the, the neat thing about it is that it isn't just um, able to operate at these different levels, but it actually brings them all together so that what we can do at these really big, you know, national and international scales can connect up with some of that local action and we're all sort of pushing the dial in the same direction. I'm going to pause here and pass on to Herman, um, who is going to share a, um, a bit of a case study, which I'm quite excited to see um, because I haven't, I haven't seen um, where this has got to. So over to you, Herman. Thank you so much, Kate. And I'm going to take some help from my colleague, Matthew, here. So Matthew, if you could just share screen, then I could jump into it. Right, so the fascinating thing about the work that Kate has been doing is when we were engineering a solution, there were some things that we knew intuitively, but which we struggled to quantify. And today we can look at the work that we're doing with the filter of the planetary accounting network based on the planetary boundaries and begin to recognize what those impacts are. And this is important because it then helps us to recognize what are the uh, practical interventions, both from an operational perspective, from uh, arguably a political perspective, and an engineering perspective, can be done to devise the solution that is hopefully a little better and uh, has less of a neg negative impact on our uh, natural world. So, as a starting point, we look at a farm, and this makes sense contextually in, in New Zealand because the primary sector is uh, one of the largest generators of employment and also uh, a key part of New Zealand's exports. But that being said, also the single largest emitter. So definitely uh, a sensitive industry to be speaking about, but I thought a worthwhile place to start. So if we look at the left of this 
farm system, we see that we have inputs that go into a farm, primarily in the form of uh, fertilizer and water. Rati, if you could reduce that screen a little bit, please. Let's zoom out slightly. And so, so there's water and fertilizer that goes into a farm. But when we look at what's happening before the time that fertilizer gets to the farm gate, we see that there is mining for minerals and fossil fuel. And mining as an activity obviously has an impact on land use. It leads to land use change, it causes toxic waste. These are, uh, I think, what in the planetary accounting uh, framework are referred to as novel entities. There's also a negative environmental footprint from the combustion of fossil fuel, but I think that's a concept everyone understands really well. The parts that we're beginning to struggle with are the way we farm today, and that's not just New Zealand, but around the world. Industrial agriculture also leads to a depletion in soil quality. It leads to a degradation in the ability for soil to provide nutrients to plants. It, it depletes the ability of cohabiting microorganisms <coughs> in their ability to keep soil healthy. So that could also be quantified as a biodiversity loss. And the tragedy of all of this is the typical human response then is to use even more fertilizer and more water to solubilize this, to add it to soil in the belief that that is what will lead to uh, a consistent or a higher crop yield. But that isn't true. And then you have the flow on effects out of farm, which are now understood in terms of the nitrogen use, the phosphorus use, and also the waste that are produced by primary industry. There's also within a regional framework, the need for these farms to send their produce to cities. And these cities then have requirements of infrastructure all their own. And here typically what we'll find is that there is green waste infrastructure, there are wastewater treatment plants. There's an energy requirement of a council uh, to operate these facilities. And there's obviously a footprint associated with this energy use. And this is, again, has an impact in terms of uh, essentially greenhouse gas emissions. And those can be found either in terms of the actual emissions from the waste that goes to landfill, but also in the energy use to manage and operate such systems. So this is business as usual. This is what happens on a day-to-day -day business. This is on a day-to-day -day, uh, functioning of the way we live. But when we look at it in the context of planetary boundaries, we begin to see that these impacts are now felt on the local ecology. There is water use, there is a decrease in um, biodiversity, there is an increase in emissions. These emissions are both in the form of carbon dioxide, which we understand conventionally, but also in the form of methane and nitrous oxide, which have significantly higher global warming potential as compared to carbon dioxide. And there's also the persistence of these novel entities that are created either through the direct use of these products or in the manufacturing processes to create these products that linger within our natural environment for unimaginably long periods of time. So, this is business as usual. This is what is happening in the 21st century. And while the problem statement isn't new, and while it's great to apply the, uh, the planetary boundaries as a guideline to inform what we do, the question we often get asked is, 
well, what can we do? It's it's all about the economy, stupid. And that's the part which we've begun to recognize is uh, is something that we're all struggling with. So there is business as usual. There's everything that we know conventionally. There are the entire systems that are set up. Everything that we're familiar with. And while we're cognizant of the fact that our current way of life is not sustainable, we often grapple with what a potential solution could look like. So here we've taken a stab at it. It's it's something that we're seeking to do uh, in New Zealand. It's it is what has essentially brought me to uh, to New Zealand as an Edmund Hillary Fellow, in in the hopes that we can create an alternative means and a method of dealing with our organic waste particularly, such that we might form one small part of a solution that enables us then to live within the planetary boundaries, right? So in such a system, what we perceive it to be, now that's our logo at the top, but that is what we're using as a placeholder for uh, an integrated waste treatment plant or an IWTP. So as the name suggests, what an IWTP does is it processes all the organic wastes that are available within a region. Now, while I won't delve too much into the technology of this IWTP and how it works, what it seeks to do essentially is utilize a conventionally well understood process of biomethanation, but with a little bit of uh, operational and systems engineering that allows it to deal with uh, the vagaries in the supply chain of biomass or, or available organics, and also with changing weather conditions, such that there is a slightly more consistent level of operation. Now, such a system, what it does is the inputs to this integrated waste treatment plant come both from the city level, which includes the likes of the green waste and the wastewater sludge that comes from councils, but also uh, the waste from farm, which includes manure, which includes uh, crop residues, which includes some degree of, of spoilage of produce, and also significantly from the primary sector, a large part of the waste that the primary sector generates. So examples of this in New Zealand would be dairy processing sludge. It would be offal from meatworks. It's things like mussel shells and uh, fish heads, and in some cases, entire fish that, that don't meet uh, human consumption standards. It includes crop residues of which a significant quantity is, is burnt every year. So all of this then gets sent to the IWTP in the region. And here it is about what is locally available because again, we recognize that there is uh, an environmental cost associated with the transport. So we would like to minimize this as far as possible. And all these inputs go to an IWTP and like I said at the start, it works in a conventional biomethanation process, but it puts out essentially energy and a digestate. And this digestate is in essence, the nutrients that are required on farm. However, since this is organic in nature, and it also contains what we would call good microbes, these seek to address the imbalances that have been created in our natural systems, help to restore organic carbon in soil, help to create a, a healthy environment for other microorganisms and other uh, smaller creatures to migrate back to soil, and also reduce the amount of water use on farm. And so here what we begin to see is that we can, with a little, uh, with a slightly more considerate approach, be sensitive to our local environment and start living within the planetary boundaries while still meeting the requirements that we have in terms of managing our organic waste, ensuring public health metrics are, are met. 
ensuring that we have uh, portable water supply. And without an overreach in terms of what we can achieve uh, through some fantastical technological intervention to do something that will suddenly save us because technology is going so fast. That I think is a fallacy. It's important to call that out. It's what the planetary accounting network and the planetary boundary guidelines serve to show us is that we need to engineer the way uh, we live to comply with what the biophysical limits of the earth are. And through such a, what on the face of it seems like a simple intervention, we can collapse the need to send any of our waste to landfill. We avoid the emissions associated from the landfill itself. We avoid the emissions associated with the transport of waste to landfill. And we avoid the wasteful practice of intensive mining that is required to support the kind of industrial agriculture that we take for granted as a way of life today. And this is a rather simple example. In terms of realistically what is happening in New Zealand, some of you may be aware, some of you might not, but there are several regions in New Zealand where waste is transported over 300 or 400 kilometers to a landfill in another region. And that's because some region somewhere has consented the use of a landfill and another region elsewhere has not. And so therefore, the only option then is to transport waste from one region to another, to dump it into a hole in the ground. Tragically, that's going to make no real impact on what it means for the council that's sending its waste elsewhere, but it just speaks to the NIMBY or the not in my backyard culture that is so pervasive across the globe really. With that, we can now look at perhaps taking any questions uh, that the audience may have, if there are any specifics uh, that anybody would like to ask Kate or Matthew or myself, then we're happy to, to answer these. Can I, uh, so I'm just going to do a small experiment, Kate and Haman, thank you so much for that talk. Um, I am going to share the Miro board in the chat. And I'm taking a risk, but you know, we, we're so, we're living on, um, you know, in this environment where we have to operate digitally. So I'd love it if we could get some interaction here. And I highly encourage you to participate by clicking on this link that I've just shared with everybody. Now, um, I'll give you another one just in case that one doesn't work. All right. So, share screen. One of the things that happens in these spaces is that there's so many people, but so many questions. And what I'd really love to do is to see if there's any groups of questions. Okay, so um, I am unlocking a little question board down here that you should be able to see now. And you, if you can see my screen, you can see you can grab these little question marks and you can go and drop them onto the board. So what I'd really like is uh, if you can grab your question marks and drop them into the location that you have a question or a challenge or, or something that you're interested in for us to talk about. And we'll start to see whether there's any groups there, okay? Um, and my request is that we, we do this for two minutes and you've got three question marks. So yeah, let's get to it. Great to see some visiting artists. I'm going to um, stop that share for the time being and go back to conversations and take some inspiration from Michelle, who has been 
<laughs> at the beginning of this is very good at curating a uh, a listening space. I um I don't even know what to say to be honest with you apart from referring back to Dallas, who was the one that curated the bookshelf in the background around a lightning talk that she had to do the other night where somebody she was doing some code training with somebody and they um their slides messed up they're like hey can you can you throw up a lightning talk and she ended up doing off the cuff a lightning talk on the new zealand and ireland rugby game coaching government uh government employees in singapore around how to use agility so yeah i, I don't know i have to, I have to learn something from the way that she was able to masterfully interlude and <laughs> take on the lightning talk so quickly. I can see in the background still some movement going, so I'll give it another 30 seconds. Oh, I may not have dropped or locked all of the boards. <laughs> sometimes these experiments go well, sometimes they don't. Don't worry if you break anything, guys. It's all fixable. Okay, are we seeing any trends yet? So we've got some questions around sludge. Okay, I'm going to bring that board up and um, share screen for a second and then get us into back into this talk. Um, okay, so from, from what I can tell, it looks like we've got questions around nutrients, wastewater sludge, and actually more questions about the technology. Um, does anybody want to come off mute and ask uh, the question about their technology that they were interested in? Sorry, I'll just jump in. Um, hi, kia ora, I'm Nikki Solomon. My question is, uh, is the technology that, that is being suggested here anaerobic digestion or, or something different? Yes, it is. Okay. And so um, I guess then my question is, obviously, you know, there is um, there are projects happening around the place that are um, including aerobic anaerobic digestion um, so, so so I guess my question is are we talking about anaerobic digestion but assessed more holistically within the planetary accounting framework or are we talking about a next generation anaerobic digestion or I guess what's different is kind of my question yes fantastic question Nikki thank you so what's different is yes there is a risk that we end up trying to create bioenergy solutions at a very large scale, which is what has typically happened in other parts of the world. And then they become dependent on certain market interventions and those don't necessarily lead to the desired outcomes. For us, the desired outcome at a primary uh, level is to address the organics part of the story. So looking at it as the first lens is in terms of waste minimization, but also in terms of emissions reduction. And then thirdly, also in terms of the nutrient return uh, to natural living systems. In terms of what's different technologically, uh, I can't divulge much, but it's simple and interventions essentially to address the challenges around very large scale anaerobic digester, digesters, which then typically can work on only one type of feedstock and are then sensitive to any changes to the digestive environment, either in form of a contaminant or uh, a reduction in supply. So here it's about building it to a minimum viable size. So how small can you go? And that's one. Second, to address the variability, can you process more than one feedstock? 
So you can process different types of organics in a single system. Does that answer your question sufficiently? Yes, that's great. Thank you. And sorry, I should have, um, I don't want to take too much time, but just quickly um, to explain the context, I'm leading a program initiative in Hawke's Bay, which is about bringing food producers, more manufacturers than growers, but probably we have to expand the scope together to collaborate around um, sustainability, particularly value from waste. And so um, bioenergy is kind of on the radar, obviously, but um, the complexities that you guys have identified are kind of where I think we get stuck. Um, so, yeah, I'd be really keen to pick up the conversation subsequent um, rather than taking taking your time now. But uh, thank you. That, that's a great answer. Thank you, Nikki. We'll be in touch. Any more questions? So are there any more questions on technology? There was one, two, three, four, five, six people that put something there. So is there anybody else that would like to ask a question on that prior to moving off to looking at uh, sludge or, or nutrients? Hi, uh, Tony Moore, Christ City Council. Just a real quick question. You've obviously proposed, um, you've got a new uh, technology or solution there and I just wonder if you could share where it's being used and what the results have been so is it actually built in play running operating and uh, and how that's going yes hi so we're currently in the process of uh, building our first technology demonstrator for a council in New Zealand I don't know if I'm at liberty to name names. I'd probably defer to Matthew for that. But yes, we're building our first technology demonstrator in New Zealand as we speak. Yeah, I'm happy to, to, to cover that as well. Um, hey, thanks, Tony. That's a, a really good question. Uh, it is also one of the challenges that we have and why we're trying to apply a new lens to this because we found over the last 12 months to try to address climate change conversations inside of uh, council is actually quite difficult through what we would consider the RFP process. So while we're looking at anaerobic digestion in New Zealand, it actually hasn't had a big uptake because of the fact that there the perceived return on investment is very low. So we don't see anaerobic digestion in uh, industry because of the fact that they're processing a multiple processing a single feedstock and then they don't want to necessarily to take a, a feedstock from a council to combine it whereas um, and if you look at what the intention of the Evan Hillary Fellowship is itself is to bring you know patent ideas and you know UN sustainable development goal focused projects to New Zealand to incubate them in the New Zealand environment and export them back to solve global problems and so you know, one of the challenges we see as well is that Haman's background is a part of a significant consortium in India that has built and is building right now an anaerobic digestion system uh, that's nearly 200 tonnes in scale. So, so our, when, when you're asking that type of question, we see two types of results depending on kind of where somebody's come from. Is it, is it has it been built here before and therefore is it proven? Or uh, it hasn't been built here, therefore it's not proven and therefore we won't accept it. And what we're saying actually, and especially inside of the Climate Accelerator Program with, with Creative HQ is actually we need to take a step back and stop procuring our solutions based on the same frameworks and think about them uh, more from an agility perspective and look at what is the problem that we're trying to solve and how can we solve that iteratively rather than um, trying to solve it all at once. So for example, in Canterbury, you know, we have a dairy producer that wants to get rid of death sludge and we have a council with a, a greenway system that, that needs to be replaced. You know, how can we work collaboratively with industry and council and then environment Canterbury, for example, where there's a nitrates issue to say, how are we all going to come together to, to leverage the R&D budgets that are coming out of, out of government around emissions reduction, waste reduction, process heat uh, and sustainable land use to do new types of projects, right? Leveraging, you know, leveraging the, the aims that council has, the, the R&D that can be done out of, a, out of a site like Lincoln, the community, uh, you know, where the industry is going, we know we need to reform. So there, 
there's this momentum to do this type of work. But, you know, for example, with, with the council, we would say, well, what we're interested in is a, is a piece of land and a waste stream, and then we'll take care of the rest. And those private public partnerships really haven't been proven in that waste industry space yet. And so, you know, there is a lot of things to take into consideration that, that, and, and that don't really get asked through that traditional procurement process. And that's why we're, we're holding these types of talks to start to reshape how we have those conversations. Nice, thank you. Good explanation, Matthew. Matthew, I have a question here from Gary. Um, so your system is primarily focused on solid organic wastes and the Nelson pilot will be a great example for others once that's going. What do you think should be done with regard to recycling precious water as a non-potable water source for industry and agriculture across Aotearoa? Amar, is that something you want to take? Yeah, I'll answer that. So when, when we say solid organics, uh, organics by their very nature can contain considerable moisture, unless we're talking about straw, which uh, has been dried and baled. So most of the organics that go to an anaerobic digester already contain a lot of moisture. And in fact, anaerobic digestion uh, is not as efficient with dry substrates as it is in, in substrates that contain moisture. So that's one part of it. Secondly, in terms of the water use, the, the tragedy with water in New Zealand currently is there should be no reason for New Zealand to struggle with water because it's blessed with perhaps one of the highest per capita availability uh, of fresh water anywhere in the world. The function of pollution in New Zealand's water system is a consequence of anthropogenic activities, primarily around uh, water use by industry and water use on farm. And this is the part where, as, as we spoke about earlier, farmers get scapegoated for. So the wastewater system in New Zealand needs to be addressed. The wastewater treatment uh, in New Zealand is still rudimentary in a lot of places. The fact of the matter is that council wastewater systems, a lot of the time end up treating uh, wastewater that is being discharged in uh, from primary industry and not from, from city council. And these rates then fall upon city dwellers rather than the primary industry that is discharging into those uh, uh, water networks to begin with. So, there, there is no simple answer really to what we do with uh, water in New Zealand, but yes, there's three waters reform that's coming up. A lot of what happens now will determine, will be determined by the technology choices that are made in terms of how that water is managed primarily. So I think there are two separate conversations here. But on, on the waste side of things, what we need to recognize is that if we process organics more efficiently, then we have essentially a free energy source uh, to power a wastewater treatment system. And that is something that can be evidenced in, in, in any region in New Zealand. Uh, pick one and then I'll give you specifics. I, I guess if I could uh, have a supplementary question and maybe address it to Kate. Um, I, I think the, um, the way you've explained the um, the elementary systems uh, approach to organic wastes, yeah, where with some water, it would be very interesting to see the intersection of, of that with um, with our, our waste water cycle. Just so because we we're talking about, you know, similar consumers and similar producers, and I, I just feel it would be quite good for us to make sure that we we don't ignore the two the two you know the blue and the green if you like or the blue and the brown um, in terms of the planetary system. So maybe maybe Kate could uh, could could draw the diagram next time and sort of show how those two intersect. Because uh, we are we are using a lot of fresh water once, um, and and if you look at Tamara Otawai, which is uh, you know behind so much of our reform, we have to to be looking at multiple uses of the water if we're going to to value it um, uh, correctly under the planetary system. I suspect. Yeah, I think that's that's spot on. It's really nice to see you, Gary. Um, but. <laughs> I guess just I guess to to that point, uh, one of the things that was most 
debated in the development and planetary accounting is that addressing of um, sort of green, blue and grey water. Uh, and there's, um, you know, I guess a couple of different schools of thought about how you how you look at water systems and, you know, whether green water, so rainwater coming down gets counted or not. Um, but actually, when we are using green water, we're extracting that from the natural system, which I think is exactly the point you're making. And so the way that we quantify it in planetary accounting does include that green as well as as well as blue. Um, so water extracted from from lakes and rivers and, um, and water aquifers and and grey water. So the um, the uh, water pollution, I guess, if you like. Hmm. Yeah, I could. I have long discussions to be had on this subject, but yes, on the course. absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Liam. I see you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, kia ora koutou. I'm Liam. I'm a zero waste and circular economy advocate and researcher. Um, really appreciate the chance to have this um, quoted all. Thank you. Um, really, really interesting, fascinating, and inspiring in some ways. But um, I just wanted to ask around. Um, how the system manages contaminants. Um, the, you know, speaking about this novel entities issue that um, we're talking about in the planetary boundaries framework, because uh, um, one um, project I'm involved in at the moment, I've been looking at contamination of organic waste streams. And in particular, um, sewage sludge seems to be um, a, a very risky um, feedstock for, for, for these types of systems. Um, and so I'm just really curious about how, how an integrated system, because I understand the rationale be, behind an integrated system, but how you would manage once you sort of stick everything together into an integrated uh, facility, how you actually manage those novel entities uh, not ending up coming out the other end, if we're, especially if we're using this in our food systems and agriculture and that sort of thing. So um, yeah, I'm wondering if someone could speak to, to that issue. So Kate, would you like to address that first or? I think that's a, a technology, technology one for you, really. Thanks, Liam. That comes up very often. And uh, yes, it's a great point. It is something we're mindful of. So what we focus on in terms of contaminants are uh, largely pathogens, heavy metals, uh, hormones, because that's increasingly something that we observe. And uh, we are obviously mindful of novel entities as well. Now, there are a couple of things that happen within the system which involve mechanical pre-processing, thermal pre-processing. There's also a dilutive factor. There's an anaerobic environment. And then there is a dehydration of the product at the end, which then allows us to develop something which while it's still not yet tested in New Zealand, it is part of the work that we're doing currently in terms of assessing its uh, use in agriculture, right? So it is something that we're mindful of. We know the direction we need to take and we are addressing it in, in a phased manner. Yeah, okay. another element, sorry, just another element to add to that was that, you know, Haman kind of mentioned it earlier around the idea that anaerobic digestion in New Zealand has traditionally been single, single feedstock and then as large as possible. And then when the souring occurs because of that contamination, that whole entire feedstock goes into landfill. So the kind of conversations we're having around modularization and small, small anaerobic digestion, but still uh, having a positive return on investment from an economic perspective, as well as a positive return on investment from a planetary accounting network perspective, uh, is that those modular, smaller anaerobic systems will pick up will pick up contamination, and the entire feedstock will not be destroyed. And so, you know, when it comes to minimizing what goes into landfill, it absolutely is along along those lines. We'll then pick up the data out of that system, a data out of that system to then return information back to council or to government around actually how do you stop that contaminant coming in upstream? And so, you know, one of the issues that we see is our built environment has never been intelligent. We've 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 procured solutions for lowest possible cost or cost minimization rather than maximum value and value creation. So our, our mindset is to turn around and make these systems smart connect them back into either smart housing or industrial environments using um, art, 
using um, IoT and artificial intelligence and actually pick up those detectors so that we can put the cost back onto that back onto the system that created it. So it yeah, it's not about just building dumb infrastructure. We have to build intelligence into these systems so that they can interact because we've become we've become disconnected from our built environment. And that's why we pollute it. We've become disconnected from the environment, which is why we we don't care for it. And you know, while while we're trying to bring back this Matarangi Māori led view, is that if you if you go onto a papakainga, you go onto a marae, you know, Māori are still so connected to the environment because they're brought up in an brought up in a household where we're not you're not separate from the environment, therefore you're not separate from the place that you're polluting. So we have to go and undo that systemic change that's occurring or that's occurred in our in our culture as well. So. When you talk about an elementary system being a living system, it's not about just an anaerobic digestion system. It's not about, it's about a living system connecting back into the people that utilize it and giving the tools back to those people that put those inputs in. Um, and so, yeah, we can we can dive into that work offline around how we're addressing that. But um, yeah, a very good question. And it's, it's one that has to be solved at many different levels. Liam, do you want to put your um, email address in there or send it to me directly and then I can add it to an email list? But Vicky, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Kia ora. Can you hear me? Is that working? Yes, perfectly. Oh, great. Sometimes it doesn't. I have to do the right selection on my microphones and things. So my, I'm interested, you mentioned um, regional, a regional plant and, that, and you've specifically referenced Canterbury a couple of times. And I'm just calling it, Canterbury is an enormous region and um, many of the sort of systems I look at that I'm interested in around, um, you know, sort of like energy supplies or uh, water management. To me, many of the more sustainable options now are looking at ever decreasingly small, you know, more small locally, lo located locally disseminated systems but you seem to be talking much more here about a much larger system that's bringing waste in from different streams like all the various farms I mean I went to Ashburton which is the other day which of course is one of our big more industrialized farming areas and it's a good hour and a half away from Christchurch and of course moving all that many of the farms at the moment um don't in Canterbury because we have such permeable soils don't necessarily have as much um, effluent storage or collection systems as what you might have in some of the areas with lower permeability soils hence of course the problems we have because it soaks straight through the ground and it goes to to groundwater but it means that there's a whole load of infrastructure required if we were to be able to collect up all that effluent on these farms and put it into some sort of transport system to get it to a centralized place so there's some aspects there that to me don't actually sound as sustainable as a, a more disseminated farm-based waste management system solutions. Um, and also I've been listening to a lot of um, regenerative agriculture podcasts, which some there's an ability potentially here to shift to farm systems where essentially they are managing their nutrients and their feed growth and so on without needing imports. And so that in itself is completely self-contained. So I'm not saying there isn't a, a place for, for example, anaerobic digestion, but I'm not sure that an entire regional scaled solution with all that transport that's associated with it and collection systems and everything else is necessarily, um, you know, the ideal option. So I just wonder, what are you, am I misunderstanding here what you're pitching? Because, um, yeah, that disseminated system seems to me to have a lot of benefit from a lower energy input um, more resilience in longer term, less carrying moisture around, which is heavy, of course, um, and so on. So perhaps you could answer that question. Thank you. Yes, and I'm, I'm happy to respond to that. So uh, close to Ashburton is the town of Methven, and we've actually carried out an assessment on farm. What we recognize today is that if we were to provide an on-farm standalone solution, then the effluent from a dairy station, uh, from a milking station that's milking about 500 cows, that effluent would be sufficient to produce, uh, would, would produce su sufficient energy to chill the milk at that dairy station ahead of transport, right? So that is one example of a problem statement of uh, solving at a farm level. So that is one thing that we can do. And, 
which right is is uh, better for the environment as well because then you don't have that effluent being pumped to ponds. But when I say regional level, I'd also like to bring your attention to what happens uh, at dairies where now these farmers have transported milk. And now there's milk that's coming in, not from 500 cows, but perhaps from 50,000 cows or 100,000 cows to a single dairy plant. Now, this dairy plant, amongst all the other functions that it has, uh, uses coal to provide process heat for the boiler. All dairy, process, all dairy factories have a coal-fired boiler. They also produce a dairy processing sludge. Now the problem statement at this scale, what we've observed is while there is a move within uh, the government to say that we need to decarbonize industry and there's funding available, and one of the options is to move from coal to electric boilers, there is not enough generation capacity in that last mile of the grid, uh, there is not enough energy supply into that last mile of the grid to support an electrical boiler, which would put a massive load on the electrical grid. And so in such a situation, it's not feasible switching to an electric boiler, but you still have a massive dairy factory in, in rural Canterbury that's processing milk from thousands of cows that uh, still needs to decarbonize its, its energy need. In such a situation, if you were to process the dairy sludge from that dairy plant itself and co-digest that with, for example, straw or any other crop residue or at whatever is locally available, you can create an energy uh, system which is localized, which could then be part of the solution. Like I said, it's never going to be a silver bullet. This is going to solve every problem sort of a thing, but that is doable. So, that's how it works uh, at a regional level. But yes, we are conscious that we want to avoid transport. Uh, scope two and three emissions is something that we talk about a lot. In Canterbury, there are large city councils that, that truck their sludge elsewhere because there's, there's no means or method of disposal locally. So it's horses for courses. The solution can be scaled from as small as, as three tons per day, which is our first technology demonstrator, to what we've actually built in India, which is 200 tons per day. So depending on what the need is, depending on what the feedstock availability is, depending on whether we're engineering a waste minimization solution or whether we're engineering an energy solution, it's uh, we're agnostic and we, we build to what's required. That's really helpful. And that's really clear that you are talking about disseminated and not uh, when you said region, it sounded like we we're going to put all the waste into one plant, which I know some of those massive energy to waste plants do exactly that. So no, that's reassured me. Thank you. No, but uh, but it is part of the problem and why. And we're not we're not trying to pick on Canterbury, but it's where it's where we see such incredible opportunity to pivot what is industrial agriculture into a more sustainable land use, and specifically when you look at Canterbury creating resilient infrastructure has to take into consideration some of Canterbury's history as well. So we're, we're, we're opposed to large infrastructure. We don't think building 100 ton plants is the future. You know, we think the sweet spot is around eight, to, eight tons to 20 tons. And to have these is, is co-located as close to um, where that gas energy offtake could be, could be utilized. And so, no, we're absolutely opposed to large pieces of infrastructure. We don't think that's the future. We think that's what's been done in Europe. We don't think that can be commercially viable in New Zealand. And I th we think that there's evidence of, of, you know, $100 million projects that are doing that at, at the moment. And, you know, and we, we, you know, we did a talk with Ariaki around resilient infrastructure. It needs to be local, needs to be locally owned. And, and it's more than that. It's, it's not just about locally owning it. The reality is, is if we don't have local, if we don't have iwi involved in a, you know, you know, and tie the water plan to a five-year plan to a hundred-year plan, our procurement really isn't looking at what's the cost of water going to be in ten years' time, right? That, that's the point of the planetary accounting network um, and the standards associated with it. It starts to ask different questions. You're asking questions about how can our organics look at nitrates. You, you're asking questions about how can how, is, how does a procurement of an organic system actually start to impact our land use, right? So if we start to apply that Maori worldview, then and look at context of place and well-being, 
we're not just looking at, okay, well, how much does it cost and what physical location does it need to be in? So it, it's, it's significantly bigger than just, are we building a single plant? We have to look at ownership models and we have to look at, you know, um, you know what, are the, what, what are the underlying well-being elements of it? So um, I hope that provides a bit more context. Now, I'm, I'm just conscious of time and, you know, um, you know, is, is it, does, sorry, does anybody else still have a burning question that they, that they want to kind of present and um, what, what, it's just kind of on the top of their tongue, they need to get it out. I think we have time for one more. Yeah, I could I could do one more just quickly. Um, thank you. Um, I just had a question about um, digestate in general. Um, I, my understanding, my sort of lay person's understanding is that digestate through the process of digestion is stripped of a lot of carbon and so it's high in nitrogen. And so I'm just wondering how do we, if we're using that as a fertilizer, how do we address you know, that affecting, exacerbating the nitrogen cycle, which, you know, we already know is being um, exceeded as a planetary boundary? So, excellent question. And again, I'll answer that in two parts. So, uh, but I'll answer the part around the planetary boundary first. The problem we have uh, with nitri nitrogen runoff is that the way we provide nitrogen to plants in terms of solubilized urea solutions limit the ability of the soil uh, or for the plants to actually absorb that free nitrogen. Plants can only absorb, absorb nitrogen when it's in the form of a nitrite or a nitrate, and that requires symbiotic microorganisms in soil. So there is bacterial activity, there's fungal activity, which then converts that nitrogen into something that plants can absorb. Now that nitrogen cycle, it doesn't rain nitrogen from the air. So that's why we have a runoff and leaching from nitrogen. The second part with it is uh, in terms of the emissions thereof, uh, in terms of nitrous oxide, which then is a greenhouse gas again, which causes its own shadow problems. Coming to the digested side of things, uh, your point is, is excellent, but that's some of the key part around our IP is that we optimize carbon nitrogen ratios of the input feedstock ahead of loading the digester. Mm -hmm. And what that ensures is not only a far more thorough digestion process, it uh, also means that we have a digested product, which if it requires uh, land application, then will ensure that the, those ratios aren't out of whack. I think we lost you. Oh, he's still there. He's missing. Oh, um, well, yeah. thanks. Thanks. Yeah. So I just want to give the op sorry. Sorry to cut you off, Liam. Um, I just want to give the opportunity to throw back to Kate. Um, and you know, um, look, Kate, kind of, I'd love you to apply and wrap us up and just kind of looking at you know, apply your lens to this. And then I'm really keen because these questions that have been asked are completely relevant to you know how you know, how we can start to look differently at solutions. And so we're really interested to find out about what we can do to, to use planetary accounting network in, in real use cases. Yeah, thanks, Matthew. And I think it's been um, such an interesting discussion and really, I guess, speaks to the need to be able to put some numbers around this complexity because so many of the questions have been about that that difficult balancing between one impact or another transport versus you know water things like that which are really difficult to make any sensible decisions about um, without putting some some numbers behind. Um, I just, I guess, um, wanted to share um, just briefly um, how how we operate so that if, if um, there's, you know, um, people are keen to look at how planetary accounting might be able to help um, them, um, there's a few different ways to work with us. So I run um, 
two organisations. One's called Planetary Accounting Network, um, and we're a charitable trust that basically helps people to use planetary accounting, but we also identify where we think planetary accounting can make the most impact uh, and um, raise funds to run, run projects. Uh, the other is a new company called Digital uh, Planetary Insights, which basically takes these initiatives and um, systems of planetary accounting to scale. So PAN's um, about four years old and we're pretty rapidly growing network of organizations. So all these organizations are working with us to um, either use our planetary accounting for their own decision making or to um, test um, and support our work. Uh, and I guess one of the really exciting things that we've been working on is a, an initiative called Planetary Facts, which really focuses in on the um, sort of supply chain and product sustainability piece. Uh, so we've been uh, developing a standard um, with a few um, quite big NZN firms like the Warehouse Group. Uh, and uh, it's a new way of um, uh, being able to uh, communicate sustainability performance, but also to quantify it. So it's inspired by nutritional facts, labels on food products. Um, the, the neat thing about those nutritional facts labels is that they can give you consistent information about any food product in the supermarket. If you go and look at eco labels in the supermarket today, you'll find you know different, different labels uh, on every different sort of type of food. Imagine if you could get planetary facts about the carbon, the nitrogen, the water footprint of any product, not just food, um, across all of your purchases. Um, but also as a business, imagine if you just had that insight so that you could design and improve those products and, and develop the products that people want. Um, some of the other initiatives um, that we are running as well is that we're working with organizations to help them expand their corporate targets to be from carbon to planetary science-based targets. Um, we're actually partnering with Becca to look at um, planetary accounting for regions and cities um, and how you take that lens to really um, develop these roadmaps to take forward. And we're working on some education programs so that our um, new graduates actually come out with that broader systems thinking lens. Um, Planetary Insights is really focusing in on that planetary facts side of things, so that supply chain piece, and um, we've just opened a beta program, which is pretty exciting, where companies can come and um, be part of the development so that they can get insights about their whole supply chain um, across um, different product categories. Uh, so I guess at the moment, um, the biggest opportunities to work with us are um, really to become part of the planetary facts program with PAN, where you can um, there's an opportunity for 10 companies to work with us and pilot our labels on the shelf with real customers over the next 12 months um, and also to be part of our beta cohort um, to actually get those detailed insights about products um, uh, and, and you know how you can actually improve the design of these. Um, so you know I think uh, the discussion today really does just emphasize how much we really need environmental data to support decision making. Um, and so if you're interested to sort of chat with us about um, opportunities to take that data and apply it to projects that you're working on, um, I'll leave my details here and I'd, I'd love to hear from any of you. Okay, that, that's really fantastic. And I think Haman and I, we, even with our level of understanding of the whole ecosystem, you know, it really took us probably a few days to get our heads around how do we really start to apply planetary accounting. And I think we've only just we've only just scratched the surface of it. So I just want to acknowledge the work that you're doing to try to take this the standard and apply it into a into a software that's going to I think fundamentally change the way that we see and, and approach our world. Um, I love the work that you're doing. I think it is it is at a level that um, it's at a level that I think if we were able to, to apply this framework into New Zealand, it would it would begin to show the world that we're a better trade partner and that we would actually turn and pivot our, you know, we used, I mean, we used to be a clean a clean green country. I think that that is no longer the way the world sees us, right? But if we were able to use something like PAN to start to pivot and turn that back around, we would actually start to see that it would have a huge impact on our economy, not just on our ecology. So, you know, I really appreciate you putting your time into both helping Haman and us and, and taking your time out today to explain to people what work you're doing. Um, Haman, is there any words you'd like to say in closing before I, before I wrap us up? 
No, nothing really, uh, except uh, thank you to Michelle for hosting this and thank you, Kate, for uh, helping us use PAN to, to frame the conversation, provide more context. And thank you to everyone who thought it worthwhile attending. Yeah, and uh, also for the patients during the experiment around using Miro for collaboration in the middle. Uh, I really do enjoy these EHF live sessions because it does bring us into a conversation. I hate so much the one-way interactions. So appreciate you um, suffering a fool that likes to play with new things. So look with that, I'm just gonna close this off with a karakia. Uh, kia to to rangamarie, kia ranga e na iwi o te au. Uh, it's basically let your peace reign over on let your peace reign on all the people of the world. So thank you so much everybody for participating today and with that I'll close out this live session. <laughs>